This week on the Nittany Dispatch, we discuss National Signing Day and Tom Allen as Penn State's new defensive coordinator. This week on the Nittany Dispatch. Hello and welcome to the Nittany Dispatch. I am John Sauber, Penn State football writer at the Center Daily Times. She is Audrey Snyder, covering Penn State football for The Athletic. And we, much to some people's chagrin, I guess, are tired. <laughs> it's been a very <laughs> long National Signing Day. Yeah, apparently that's, you know, it's been a long National Signing Day, part of a long, busy month. But John, kind of the, the theme, I think, for James Franklin, he said it last Friday at Bowl Media Day. He said it again Wednesday. They are in under promise over deliver program which feels like a lot like us here at the nittany dispatch listen that's my whole life is under promise over deliver we're we're not we're not promising a lot on this one today there is a lot to get into yes Um, there is it's it's been a long day um penn state started with seven well the live stream went up at 7 a.m but 7 15 a.m first commitment came rolling in that rolled on for about four hours then we heard from james franklin later today they introduced tom allen 80 well, we, bet craft talk. There was a say, lot. If we're going sequential, it was a 7 a.m. show ends at like noon. And we talked to Pat Craft at 1 30. Then we talked to James at about 2 15. And then some of the recruiting staff, including uh, recruiting coordinators, uh, Terry Smith and Marcus Haggins, obviously cornerbacks and wide receivers coach, respectively. And then closing it out with a Tom Allen introductory press conference. Uh, and then you and I have been writing for a while, which is why we're mm-hmm. recording so late tonight. Uh, but it is, it has been quite the day. Um, we'll get into everything, but, but before we do that, don't forget to rate, review, subscribe to the podcast at Apple Podcasts. Uh, hit that subscribe and like button down below if you're watching on YouTube. That always helps us out. Leave those five star ratings on Apple Podcasts, like I said. Uh, but this is, this is a lot, right? Like it's, it's, we're, I mean, we're 10 days away from the Peach Bowl, which I, I'm kind of, it feels Gosh, like it's getting yeah. lost in this. Uh, because there have been two defensive coordinator search or two coordinator searches. <laughs> Whoa, not so fast. Not so fast. Yeah. <laughs> just, just the one defense. Poor guy gets introduced search. and you're ready, ready to run him out of town. <laughs> no, uh, but uh, we had national signing day today too. And I think mm. that's probably the best point yeah. to start because this was uh, drama free. It was, I think for the staff, clearly pretty relaxing. They had 25 commits and they had 25 signatures uh, with 16 of those guys enrolling in like three weeks. Yeah, that's to me the the really impressive part about today. Yeah, 25 person class, which is massive, right? But no drama, right? And I always look when the war room starts, how many slots are on the board? 25 slots, 25 signees, no surprises, no decommitments, which is I think also speaks to the class and the fact that you've had two coordinator changes here in the last month and players weren't wavering, right? Like that's a testament to committing to the program, committing to the school, the university, but also I think to the leaders in that class for, for keeping this thing afloat. And Cooper Cousins is certainly one of those guys. But yeah, getting 16 players here in January is significant. And I think, you know, we've kind of seen the numbers rise since James Franklin's been here. We've also seen the last few years, especially Penn State has been able to get players here in May with that May semester. Um, there's so much value in getting guys here. Now, granted, some of it will not matter in terms of especially you get some of your your linemen here. It takes time to grow and develop, but you're getting them with Chuck Losey and this strength staff now. You're going to get to go through spring ball as opposed to having to wait the fall camp. Um, you're going to get inside this new playbook, uh, which we know for the offense, that's all going to hit after the Peach Bowl. So, yes, yeah, 16 early enrollees, significant number. Um, I know I've got the full list up on the athletic, really no surprises there. I think one thing fans have to keep in mind is that not every school allows for early enrollment. So that's right. kind of the other, the other challenge that a lot of guys have to work through, but yeah, John, I, I think kind of my other initial impression about this class, I guess I can have two initial impressions, I guess, guess that's allowed it. We have no, that's rules not allowed. yeah, we, we have no rules. Um, but the fact that you've got a lot of versatility, I think that's kind of the one thing. You look at a guy like Liam Andrews, highly coveted offensive lineman. He's going to be a defensive tackle here, and James Franklin outlined that process for us today. Um, You look at Cooper Cousins. James Franklin said they believe Cousins could play all five spots up front on the offensive line. That's insane. Um, And I think Quentin Martin is somebody that they talked a lot about today of, hey, 
he maybe can help us catching passes, which we know there's the running backs have to do that, right? You got to be able to do that. But I think also maybe that's kind of an early path to get him on the field. So to me, the versatility piece today was really huge too. Yeah, no, and I think you nailed it with especially someone like Liam Andrews, who's such a big get for them because Mm -hmm. we've seen in years past, this is seemingly, is off the top of my head anyways, the one position where they struggle to get guys consistently. Yeah. Right. Like they, they have a hard time getting the top 125, 150 guys at defensive tackle. Uh, and Andrews is that. He's going to come in. Uh, he's pretty clearly a defensive tackle and, and should be able to get there long term. Frankly, like T.A. Cunningham also has the size to be a defensive tackle. We'll see which direction one. that goes in. Yeah, yeah. He's like 6'6, 275. He's massive. Uh, should be a defensive tackle long term, too, I would think. But getting those kind of guys is really big for them because they need the guys that can come in and do it right away. Because so often you see so high end defensive tackle recruits, part of I think what makes them so good is they're more physically developed. Mm-hmm. They're closer to that 285, 290 pound range. Or are we gonna have a they're not big enough discussion, John? Is that where the don't no. tell me that's where the set is? Okay. I mean, high school defensive tackles aren't. They're Far, usually right. like much smaller. Yeah, yeah. Um the same thing is true on the offensive line, though. And and James mentioned that they have uh, a couple guys that they think are true offensive tackles. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Garrett Sexton uh is is six seven, Egan Boyer is six seven, both very long, but again, both sp- like small for an offensive tackle because 250 pounds in high school is a massive offensive lineman in college. It's tiny. And so two more guys that while they should be offensive tackles long-term, they're just not going to make an impact. I'd be surprised if either guy makes an impact in the first two years, they got to be in the strength program. They got to get there. Uh, But I do think they have so many of these guys that it's the prototypical body type that they want, right. Uh, Along the defensive line and the offensive line that I think they, you mentioned the versatility. I think they just nailed the trenches too which uh, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I'm an Eagles fan. Like this is, I am a firm believer and this is how you build a program is through the trenches and, and they need to continue to build on what has been a good offensive line the last two years. Now they need to continue to make sure that's the case and then eventually get it to being a great offensive line consistently. Yeah. And I do think they, they capitalized on that, right? Because to me, Penn state, so much of their pitch this year and it will be next year and probably in the coming years should be, Hey, look at Olu Fashionu. Right. Like, look what we're able to do with this guy. Um, You know, this was somebody who, when he came here, was was a bit of a project, you know. And so that's a really massive feather in Phil Troutwine's cap. Um, But I also think because you mentioned Liam Andrews and I wanted to make sure we we hit on the most important thing to know about Liam Andrews. If you caught it during the signing day live stream. Yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, he's apparently a Packers fan. And there's as we know, John, there's a lot of them around here. The real America's team. Uh, Garrett Sexton, of course, from Wisconsin, is a Packers fan. I enjoyed chatting with him about the struggles of our Packers during his recruitment. Um, but I, I wanted to make sure we got that in there because I did not know that about Liam Andrews. And now that's going to be when we get to talk to him here in another like year and a half. That'll be my go to. Listen, everybody has their flaws. Go Burks. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, someone else too that I wanted to touch on real quick and Quentin Martin. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that he's going to line up at receiver frequently, but I would suspect that they're going to try and get him on the field early, right? That Mm -hmm. uh, Atron Allen and Nick Singleton, though, are going to be RB1 and RB2 in some order, or RB1 and a half for both of them, maybe, uh, as I'm sure we will hear at some point based on how much uh, work they do to make sure those guys, yeah, Yeah. those guys know that they're on level playing field, which they are. Like, I don't don't think there's a need to necessarily push that messaging as often as they do, but... Uh, I think Quentin Martin is going to find himself involved in the backfield at some point, assuming he's healthy, assuming he assimilates perfectly, to, not perfectly, but assuming he's, yeah. assimilates well to college life and everything uh, because he's too good to not have on the field quickly, right? Like uh, we're, we're seeing that Andy Kodonek, he's going to want to run the ball based on the the film that I've watched mm-hmm. uh, and, and, you know, everything that everyone has seen, like they're going to want to run the ball. If you have three guys consistently that you can do it, that's not to discount the freshman that came in last year. I know London Montgomery recovered from the, the ACL and everything, but like this is Quentin Martin's a different level of recruit, right? Like yeah. he is someone that, elite, that you kinda, yeah, you, you make plans around. Um, and, and I think that he's going to have a chance to come in and make an impact right away, which, you know, I talked to Ryan Snyder of on three about this uh, for a story on, on center daily.com. Ryan is always fantastic. Uh, no relation you know, to me, to the, be clear. That's right. Great guy, but no relation to me. Very, very common last name. If we're being <laughs> honest. Uh, but the, the, the early impact guys maybe aren't there this year uh, just because it's, 
you know, it's someone like Luke Reynolds. It's like, oh yeah, he's a really good tight end, but he's got to bulk up and he's in it going into a really deep room. It's like, oh, Quentin well, Martin can play right away. Well, and we got to see with that room, John. We still don't know with Tyler Warren, but even I think if Tyler Warren moves on, I think okay. you have a pretty set, like my expectation would be that we see a lot of Khalil Dinkins and we see a lot of Andrew Rappel yet. Right. Yeah. Like, I think those are the two guys next year. Yeah. I had uh, a Schlaffer cross for sure. Yeah. yeah. I could see cross. That. I think cross, I think would work in. Like, I think he would, there's a chance that he would if be. Can, in that yeah. Dinkins if he can role. stay healthy. And yeah. Right. Uh, and like, I think all the talent is there. It's just like you mentioned, it's the health, mm-hmm. the health piece. Um, but I think with Reynolds, it's like he's got to get bigger and he's got to block because all these tight ends come in and they they played receiver essentially in high school. Yes. Right? Like, and so I Mike think Reynolds got to block. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, so I, I would be surprised if he's coming in making an, uh, a massive impact right away. Andrews, like we said, he's still got to add weight. Uh, Grunk Meyer at quarterback. Uh, Ethan is he's a I think he's really good, but Drew Haller is the starting quarterback. That is yeah. not going to change. <laughs> no, right? no like surprises is, there. Um, yeah, Grunkemeyer so will get here in January, though, which which is yeah. for sure. Right, and, and so you have all these guys though at all these positions that maybe you know it's it's just not going. The timing isn't right for them to step in right away in the positions where maybe they have that need: wide receiver, corner. Like, I don't think any of those receivers are necessarily playing early I, next year. At yeah, corner, I'm with you on that. I'm with corner, you. On that. I think either guy, like Antoine Belgrave, shorter or John Mitchell, I think they could be in the rotation. They could like you know, see like 200 snaps by the end of the year, play on special teams, but I don't think they're coming in on seating anyone because they have, you know, Cam Miller uh, coming well, back, presumed <laughs> starter. This is the we other can thing. get into that. We can get into that. Yes. I, I want to pivot back to the receivers quick because this, this is off the top of my head. Um, to Sierra Denmark is somebody that they think is kind of one of those maybe undervalued or high ceiling guys in this class. And I agree with that because I remember when he was at Roman Catholic high school, he switched to Imhotep ahead of this year, his senior year. Um, but I went to Roman Catholic to talk with him and Jamil Lyons last fall. Um, and at the time I remember he went and was like, his coach handed him all these letters, right? Like, you know, physical mailings, a lot of letters from Oregon in there. I think he was even wearing a duck sweatshirt that day. Then he had committed to Oregon like a week or two later, but really wasn't sure. Uh, Obviously, Penn State stayed on him the whole time. Now, this to me is an interesting one because, again, high upside, a lot of speed. Um, You talk about the versatility piece. Like, There are skills there that I think Marcus Higgins is going to be able to do a lot with, right? Like, I do think that he's probably better – uh, than what his ranking suggests. So, but again, in terms of early impact, I, it's tough to, I, I think it'd really be tough to see that same with a, with a Peter Gonzalez. Um, now. Josiah Brown, obviously coming off the, the yes. ACL injury, like is yeah, as that, if he is anyone next year, like he's got it. He just got to get healthy. Like year one for him, I think is about getting healthy. Like right. it was for London Montgomery that we saw. Yeah, and I think that's – and I know, you know, because we always – typically we talk to the freshmen in the winter or the spring, and it's kind of like – for a lot of guys, it's like, what was that red shirt you're like? Because it is so different. They're used to playing and playing all the time, and then you go from that to red shirting and changing your body and, and all these changes and adjustments. So it, it is a lot. Um, but to that cornerback room, John, I think it was – I don't know, maybe it was around 8 or 9 o'clock Wednesday morning – I'm like half asleep, kind of chugging my coffee, watching the live stream, taking notes. And then Terry Smith kind of, we talked last week on here about, you had said maybe there was some ambiguity with the receiving core and who's coming and going. James Franklin said they know that he didn't agree with your word choice. I think what happened. Which wasn't, by the way, it, it, it still wasn't the question. Like it wasn't, <laughs> it had nothing to do with we, receiving you know or whatever. I think yeah, it's, it's a good reminder that these decisions that players make about their futures, the coaching staff knows, Yes, but we're all kind of at, and I get it. We're at the player's mercy to they're going to announce when they're going to announce. Yes, that's fine. But sometimes there's gaps between, I guess what they think maybe we as reporters and people as fans know versus what's out there. Um, so Terry Smith was talking to cornerback, John Mitchell during his st- signing day live stream. And then I had to kind of do a double take. Yeah, I was watching it on YouTube, so I rewound because I was like not sure <laughs> that yeah. that was what was said. But Terry Smith, Penn State cornerbacks coach and defensive recruiting coordinator, uh, 
said that they're losing three cornerbacks to the NFL. Uh, they did not say anyone by name, but we know Johnny Dixon is out of eligibility. So there's one. Right. And then when John Mitchell was talking to uh, Brian Tripp, who's with, you know, with Penn State, like in their in-house show, uh, he mentions that Kalen King's off to the NFL. So that's two. Uh, and then Daquan Hardy has a who's year left of eligibility. If he wants I'm that not, sixth not, year, right. I'm not reporting anything, to be clear, right. but it seems to line up. Yeah, th- three players. Um, and then Terry Smith was then asked about it later in the day about what those three have meant. Um, and he kind of reiterated again that they've been the cornerstone in that room and that, you know, not perhaps that Penn State t- maybe, and perhaps fans, but everyone kind of took for granted or got used to the fact that, yeah, they've had really good corners. And this has kind of been it. I-, I think the thing to remember with Daquan Hardy, because I think that's the one that maybe. Maybe some fans kind of think, hmm, I'm not quite sure. He's played a ton of snaps. He certainly helped himself with his special teams play this year as a punt returner. Um, and there again, we took the versatility piece. Like this is a guy who's going to intrigue some NFL teams. I was talking to Hardy about this potential at Bowl Media Day last Friday. And he had said, you know, he hasn't made up his mind. He's going to play in the bowl game, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, this is somebody who was offered and committed to Penn State a day before signing day back, you know, in his recruiting class. It was one of those of like, I remember it was like, okay, who is this kid? How did this happen? Oh yeah. He was high school teammates with Dante Cephas, but Penn State didn't want Dante then your boy. Uh, Cause he needed to kind of get in the weight room and, and develop some more at that point. Right. So again, good example of, of how things change over time. Right. But yeah, so to me, you're kind of looking at this restocked cornerback room potentially. And Terry Smith said later Wednesday that, yeah, there's going to be a lot on Cam Miller, which again, he's played a ton of snaps already. They're going to need him to step up. And he also said, yeah, the guys in this class, there's an opportunity, right? That was kind of Terry's message to John Mitchell of, hey, like John, John, there's there's a chance here. Um, and Mitchell will get here this, uh, this January. So again, he's kind of on the, on the right path for that. We know that Penn state wants to play a lot of cornerbacks. They've consistently done that under Terry Smith. Um, but yeah, that was like the, to me, one of the most interesting little nuggets to come out of today. Yeah. And you know, it goes hand in hand with what I was about to say too, about the, about Belgrave shorter and Mitchell, like High they may teammates. not be the, yeah, and they may not be the highest rated kids in the class, but there's opportunity there. Um, but there are there's also a pretty big class last year, Elliot Washington, Zion Tracy, most notably, that I would think are gonna step in, right? Yeah. And that's right now that would be my expectation would be that Cam Miller's a starter pretty undis- indisputably, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's uh, sure. unless something happens between now and August, that's gonna be the case. And then you're looking at Tracy and, and Washington for the other spot, assuming that uh, that Hardy doesn't come back. And if Hardy doesn't come back, maybe the other one just plays the nickel. Although the way, and this, I mean, well, <laughs> there's national time based stuff to talk about, but the way Tom Allen uses what he calls the Husky in his four, two, five, cause it's essentially a four, two, five. We're going to have a lot of fun with that. Aren't we? By the way, with that like, name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like Penn state ran a four, two, five under Manny Diaz. You'd say, you know what I mean? Like occasionally went base four, three, mm-hmm. but, most of the time they're in four, right. two, five. And so this is essentially the same system. Uh, he disguises coverages more. Tom Allen does, which I think is a notable difference, but I do think that Husky rule is usually Huskier, right? <laughs> it's a, it's usually, it, it leans safety closer than corner uh, or has in the past. Now that's not to say he hasn't used corners in that role. He has, it's, mm-hmm. it's been, as I remember, I think it was like three or four years ago, Terry Smith said uh, on a, at a press conference that it's just about, it doesn't matter who, like if that the the fifth defensive back is a safety or corner, it's they're picking from wherever they have the best talent from, right? So it's like mm-hmm. if they have three guys at safety, they trust more than that third guy's gonna be a safety. If they have three guys at corner, they trust more than that third guy's gonna be a corner. Under Diaz, that was a little more like base four two five. It was a corner, like it wasn't a safety. But we saw with Brent Pry uh in the past that it was in and, and Bob Shoop too that it was a, a a mix, right? It was a safety corner hybrid. And I think this will look closer to that than a true nickel like under Manny Diaz with, with Daquan Hardy. Now, part of that too is Daquan Hardy is just really good. And so like, that's what it's going to look like when Daquan Hardy is really good, despite the, the down 2022 that he had. So essentially what you're telling me is in the spring is I need to say, hey, Tom, who's your Husky? And just- hey, Yes. Is this the- into- <laughs> are we assuming we're going to get to talk to Tom again in the spring? Is that a? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big assumption on my part. I should I should make any assumptions. 
feels um, like it might be in, until June. You know <laughs> what they say about again. assumptions, John. Um, yes, that's right. Let's take a brief break from the podcast to talk about the good people over at Voodoo Brewing Company, located at 21 Elmwood Street in State College, uh, a place that you and I visited last Friday, I think it was. Again, these days are blending together. Yes. Uh, you know, we, we go in there it's, it's a nice environment for us to work and everyone's very friendly. You know, you can, you can sit down with your laptop, get your work done, you can sit down, have good conversation because we did that too, right? Like it wasn't just working. We had good conversation with the good people there. Good uh, beverages. You know, Josh. Yeah. Good beverages. Josh, Wes, Andy are all great. So is the rest of the staff at Voodoo, but, uh, you know, they have the Voodoo kitchen there, which you and I both ate at, uh, as really you mentioned good. last time, uh, you got a pizza, I got a chicken a cheese steak. dill pickle pizza. Recommend. Yes. It's really good. Yeah. Very good. Uh, and they, uh, you know, they, they served us well there and the, the food was great. They also have cider now, which is, uh, as the weather's gotten a little bit colder, that has replaced the slushies, uh, which you love to see a nice little hot drink for you uh, on these cold winter days. Um, you know, you can sit outside by the fire pits, always a good time. They have uh, trivia Tuesday nights, bingo Thursday nights, both at 6 PM, really just a, a generally speaking, a great environment to go to, those kind of Thursday and uh, Tuesday nights give you something to like a kind of the, get out of the house in the winter, to go. Right? Yeah. yeah. But I think it generally throughout the week, throughout like the, the days of the week, like you can always go there and find yourself a good time. So uh, one of our favorite spots in state college, uh, you know, somewhere we've been going for a while, that's Voodoo Brewing Company in state college located at 201 Elmwood street. Back to the show. But yeah, I mean, I, I do think you kind of look at the, the totality of this class Um James Franklin said that they felt like they filled a lot of needs, but again, my ears kind of always perk up when you hear these things. We know what needs remain. And James Franklin even said offensive tackles, right? They're looking for body types. They can never have enough offensive tackles. Um, that's something, whether through the second signing period or the transfer portal, that's certainly a priority as is, as we know, as we've discussed on here several times before, wide several. receiver, Several is not like it is is way more than several. I don't know what as we, we discuss on here every episode. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there that's more accurate. Um, yeah, the, the receiving core needs some instant help. Nothing publicly, at least, has, has happened yet. Um, we'll see. I mean, I'm I'm hoping to to log off here at the end of uh, the end of tonight and not open my computer to Tuesday. But we know that's never how this job works. Maybe I'll get lucky and it will. Um, there also maybe are some stories perhaps pre-filed in this world of hypotheticals. Maybe we'll see. I was going to say, I think a lot of us have <laughs> written one yeah. specific story and wrote it the last, the end of last week, right around there. Right? Yeah. Um, so again, we'll you. see what, what transpires there. Um, but I do think, cause we had, again, we had a chance to talk to the recruiting coordinators who also of course double as the position coaches. So you and I were at Marcus Haggins for, I think the, I was there the entire time. I think. Yeah. I was there the entire time. Yeah. Um, and, and I thought we got into some interesting stuff. Uh, we, we got, you know, through the signing day stuff, we, we talked already about Quentin Martin and kind of, he had said similar things. So did Terry Smith about the, the receiving a uh, prospect there. I asked him about this here, Denmark, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then we started asking about the receiving core moving forward. Right. Cause again, there's no on-site bowl media day for the peach bowl. So like, we don't really know when we'll hear from some of these folks again, especially the position coaches, um, so th that's something certainly to dive into. And I believe, I think it was you who asked about Amari Evans. Cause I wrote it on my notebook yes. as like, yeah, I so showed we, it you, we were kind of like very yeah, middle we, school we, level we, passing we, notes. I was like, yes. let's not forget that. It was, it was good yeah, teamwork there. You wrote Amari Evans and I wrote down in my horrible handwriting. I can't believe that you read it, but well, you could, nodded. Yeah. You read mine. Yeah. 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 And said, I wrote down, you know, asking about who stepped up in practice over the mm -hmm. last couple of weeks, but uh, yeah, asked about Amari Evans, and and I think Marcus said a lot of what we've heard from a lot of coaches, right? Like the simplification and uh, confidence helps a lot, yeah. and that that's that's big for Amari. But um, you know, he, he mentioned a bunch of guys that have stepped up recently. Uh, Caden Saunders, though, I yes. think, and I don't I don't want to read too much into like I don't want to attribute something to Marcus that he didn't say. But I when when people tend to list things, right? Like, and they you know the the first thing that comes to mind to me that's the thing Usually, standing yeah. out the most right like that it just it's a logic you know what i mean train to that that makes sense and caden saunders was the first player he mentioned when i asked about like who's stepping up so uh guys like amari evans and caden saunders stepping up it would be enormous for penn state right because they need depth next year um trey wallace we assume will be back we have no reason to believe that he won't be 
Uh, yeah, he was asked about that. Um, again, the big thing there's the injury, right? Like, yes, we haven't seen him for weeks. But James um, said they hope to have him at Michigan State, and I would think that means he's going to play against Ole Miss, right? If it's a month after that, like, if, now he, if you're, I if, he wasn't at practice, I don't believe when we were there last week. But again, that correct. was, he was 15 not. minutes. You know, a lot can happen between now and then. Maybe he it was in the bathroom. First time. It wouldn't be as, yeah. It you wouldn't be the know. first time that they've done some obvi- obvi- obfuscation. I've struggled with that word all day. It's a big word. I know. Uh, I keep using it, and I don't know why. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time they've done that uh, over the five years that I've been here. Uh, but no, I think you know. E- either way, next year, uh, you know, Trey Wallace will be back. Uh, you know, uh, Dante Cephas will, in all likelihood, be back. I was we, gonna say the way the way they talked today certainly sounded like he's gonna be here. Yeah, we don't but know we about don't Ke- know about yeah. Keandre Lambert Smith, despite like <laughs> God forbid, no I ambiguity, there, ambiguity there. Uh, but I, you know, we don't know his status yet. He hasn't yeah. announced a decision. Um, but you know, so that could go either way. But having guys step up behind them, even if Lambert Smith comes back, doesn't come back, what have you, having Kane Saunders step up, having Amari Evans step up, that would be enormous because then if you add a, someone from the portal, that's you know, maybe was a high end talent is a solid receiver with some upside that has been a big t- in a big time program. Who's a really good blocker. Like that's the kind of addition you'd want to make. I don't know. Who would that, that be, feels John? like the kind of guy that you'd want to add. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, I asked Marcus today too, about like uh, what a hypothetical portal receiver would look like. And he mentioned that they want like uh, they, they want someone that's going to elevate the competition level, elevate the consistency, mm-hmm. essentially a pretty generic answer, which is fine. Uh, but, but mentioned like the advantage of getting older guys, mm-hmm. right. And leadership. I think you asked about that specifically. And he mentioned that there's a big advantage to getting those older guys that can kind of set the tone with their consistency. Um, you and know, getting again, guys who can be, no one in, in particular coming to mind uh, that, that we're referring well, to. That was, that's the other thing, right? He hit on the January piece, which, cause I, somebody asked him, I don't know if it was you, me, somebody else in the scrum, um, about basically what did you learn? It was probably you because it was about Dante Cephas. What did you learn about going through this <laughs> process? It was, was it? it was, uh, I asked about Cephas and then Greg Pickle asked about, um, what, what, like, what he what would have done learn. differently. Yeah. yeah. Like what you would learn it, what you would have done differently. And then Marcus just said, would have had him here in January. And, and that's, I think, I mean, that's an honest answer. And that's the thing that you and I talked and we wrote about, um, all off season. And, and you could, I mean, I think fans could, physically see the transformation right like you point back to that maryland game when things started to come together for cephas like there was a transition it was a little bit surprising i think for some people when we went to those practices and in the preseason it's like well why isn't cephas with the ones and it's like well this is gonna take some time yeah like the guy just unloaded his bags you know give give him a minute um but so again this time around you want to try to avoid that if you can now obviously you know, there, there's situations where you can't avoid that. And that was, you know, Cephas's situation. But if you can't avoid that, you want to get them there in January. So as we talk here on Wednesday, December 20th, that's where the receiving course stands. We'll see if anything changes in the next week, in the next two I weeks. I just know what's going to happen on when, like, it's going to either be Christmas Day, Eagles games going on. Oh, yeah. Or we're, yeah. we're on a flight. Like, that's it. That's when things Yeah, happen. Tuesday. Tuesday's going to be uh, everybody hunker down. Tuesday, that we'll be in the air. Um, yeah. Prepare all of your breaking news for, like, I think my flight leaves at, like, 2, 2.30, something like that. Uh, that's when it'll all come out. I'm certain of that. Mm, we say that, and then watch it'll be, like, whatever. I mean, that's that's the, the crazy honestly, part about this. This, this, this feels like year. something... Yeah, this feels like something that could drag out too. They, they semester have... starts the seventh of January, I believe. Whatever that Monday is. Yeah. The so there, there's real time to make a decision. So yeah. like that's 18 days away. That this decision does not have to come down this week or next week. Can wait. Doesn't have to happen on Christmas. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And, and by the way, people don't have to announce decisions, right? Like they can do what they want uh, and handle things how they want. But Actually, would yeah, that I, how how wild would I'm just thinking out loud here? How wild would that be, right? say receiver big time high profile receiver commits here but and again i'm not i am just pontificating here like doesn't announce anything and just like gets here goes up Did you just i mean it's just, it's just such a foreign concept in this day and age yeah. of college football um again if, if anybody was following and i'm sure many people were kind of the the sagas around the country today of 
did we get this letter? Is this guy woken up yet? I mean, it, it, the drama in this sport is unparalleled. And while Penn State had a drama-free signing day, please recognize that that is not the case everywhere in the country. Did you see the Ryan Day reaction video? No. Uh, there's a re- him reacting to, I think it was Jeremiah Smith, mm-hmm. who's the top player in the country, top receiver in the country. He's an incredible uh, recruit. Um, is very likely to be very good. Uh, and I think he announced for Ohio State around noon, somewhere around mm-hmm. there. And after and, and, and get Ryan alert. Day like was in a presser or something though, and he was like super relieved. Like he was just like, you know what I mean? Like you could see the look in his face of the stress leaving his face. But like you said, the last I had read, they still don't have the letter of intent, and Penn State has none of that issue. Yeah, I mean, they're the high stakes drama that unfolds. And, you know, you used to kind of see a little bit more of it. And you do to some extent, but with players and picking hats, and then you've got moms and dads and family members and supporters being like, what? They did this? Like the genuine surprise. That used um, to be more fun, by the way. I know fans yeah, probably thought it was stressful. I think it was more fun. It, like, I wish the, that was a thing more. The, the, I know, and even talking to, you know, recruits over time, the, the crystal ball era has changed things, right? Like, there's not. Yeah. It's it's like, hey, this guy's crystal ball says this, right? And you kind of expect that's what's going to happen, right? Like the whole process has changed. Um, I think the the last time people were genuinely shocked was when Travis Hunter flipped to Jackson State. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. If I remember correctly, he was when he was committed to Florida mm-hmm. State. Like that was out of nowhere. Um, and I think like, you know, you're right. The crystal ball stuff has kind of ruins ruined all of the suspense. Really, like everyone knows which way guys are leaning, and usually like it. Even if uh, they, even if it doesn't come out like a day in advance, it comes out like ten minutes before. You know what I mean? Like yeah. someone is hinted at something somewhere that a kid's committing. So that does, I think, take some of the fun out of it, which is unfortunate um, because, like you said, these kids used to have a lot of fun with these commitments and, and like the the things they would do. But uh, it seems we are we are long past those days. Well, and, and I with, think and with everybody... the transfer portal now, there's no like announcement ceremonies, and everyone can yeah. like I. Like you see this, not to go on a too long of a tangent, but Dylan Rayola, uh, who committed to Nebraska, the Huskies who committed to Georgia, <laughs> the Huskers. Uh, <laughs> We're getting he, close, uh, yeah, yeah, close enough. Uh, but no, he committed to Nebraska after he was committed for a long time to Georgia. Obviously, his dad played at Nebraska, was right. a legendary offensive lineman. Uh, but like this was something that was reported on for like a week in advance. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, and I'm not like, to be clear. I am not saying this is going to happen. I don't even think this is going Uh-oh. to happen. But to go into the world of hypotheticals, the reason that stuff like that is going to happen more and that makes more sense is because let's say he goes to Nebraska and he has a lot of success, but the team doesn't have a lot of success. He can leave and then he can go yep. to Georgia. He can go to Ohio State. He can go to, you know what I mean? Like he can have his or choice in these places. <laughs> Yeah, or he can go to these places that he, he wants to go. He can get the Bo Nix tre- treatment. He can get the Michael Penix treatment, right? Like, right. If I'm a quarterback, there is no incentive for me to go somewhere and sit as long as, and this is important, there's maybe a less prestigious school or less like playoff contender school that I am confident that I can get developed at, you know what I mean, by the, that coaching staff and, the, and can get to playing time too to then make that leap if I want to make that leap down the road. Because you can treat it like a, okay, oh, I want to play, and I know that it'll help me get uh, better if I play, so I'll go to, I don't know, I'll go to, I don't want to keep picking on Nebraska, go to Purdue, right? You go to Purdue, you start Boiler for a up. year, and then you move on to another school if you're playing so well and, and the team's not doing well, it's not elevating the whole program. Like, you're going to have that option now, uh, which I think for if, if quarterbacks especially, it makes less and less sense to go somewhere and sit unless you are so set on one moving sucks like like so i would totally not I understand honestly, wanting to do that I, I it's a great that reason is, to not transfer that is an underrated i think part of all of this listen I, shohei I otani signed with the dodgers because he didn't want to move <laughs> like i like, don't this that's not true but it's also definitely at least yeah. a little true like, uh, but like with if it with the moving stuff real quick like mm-hmm. moving sucks is a reason to not want to to move somewhere else or like you don't like you're committed to that school and that coach and that's you have so much trust that they'll get you where you need to go that you don't have to worry about the other stuff yeah i, I to me again I'm, I'm a sucker for logistics that's kind of my, my thing right i would and i was talking to somebody about that i think it was a parent it was, yeah it was one of the commits parents the other day we were talking about this and kind of the craziness in the sport and all the, all the movement and that type of thing and one 
I would love to see some of these transcripts, right? For guys who have transferred multiple times. It's like, bless the people dealing with these transcripts because it's going to be an absolute nightmare, right? And like, well, we know, we know Penn State's we'll not great with that. It take well, James Franklin did shout out the board today for getting together to the subcommittee on compensation, got a shout out, which was not on my bingo card for today. He um, shouted out the board, not the admissions office, though. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, this, this is a very again, the, the process, they're, right? There are admission standards, there's processes to all of these things. Um, but you have that, but then the moving piece, right? And it's like, okay, you're packing up your life, and I get it, you're in college, you don't have a lot of you don't have a lot of stuff. Um, but I think even for for coaches, right? You're you're going in, um, you're moving around, all the, all this types of stuff. Like moving is a massive pain in the ass. Like that is, yeah. Um, coaches it, can get movers though. Like I that's can't, true. They're not like us, John. I think you know what you know what today reiterated more than anything. People What's we that? cover are nothing like us. Yeah, that's and what I like, say that. Because well, the next Tom time Tom Allen and his buyout, which we will get into in a second. Yeah, but the next time I move, I am getting movers, and I do not care. Like it's, it sucks. I hate it. I hate moving. It's a nightmare always. I. Uh, but no, I it's, closed it's, on my house four years ago, John. And you know what my mm-hmm. lasting memory is? And I'm What's sitting that? here in my office. I'm looking at the staircase. <laughs> I like barely had you know internet, and that those new house was built. I look, and I get a text to my editor like knew I was moving. Jared Parker had just left that day. And I was like, nice. well, here we go. Some coaching yep. news. And I was like, I, you know, I, I don't even remember if I dealt with it or what we did. Um, but again, that kind of the James Franklin coaching tree that tells you how long ago that was four years ago. Uh, times have changed, but the coaching yes. tree, the movement, are we, is it, is it time to talk about Tom Allen? Is it the time? Yeah. Uh, I think this is a, uh, I don't know. It's really weird. I've seen a lot of consternation about this hire. Really? I kind of think that James nailed it with both him and Andy Kotelnicki. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Tom Allen is, uh, I obviously I covered him for, I don't know, 10 months, something like that when I was, was uh, it the best Indiana. 10 months of your life covering him. No. Uh, t- covering Tom. Yeah. Well, what were, your, what were your thoughts about covering Tom? What was uh, covering I'll... Tom? I had no issue covering Tom. Tom was great. He was always nice. He was always kind, which I mean, I've said since, uh, you know, since I started to hear his name surface that, you know, that, that I always thought that Tom was a very, very kind man. Uh, you liked his the... positivity. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm a bit of a curmudgeon sometimes, but, uh, I don't, Aren't I don't mind what other people are, are, are positive like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, the rest of the job was not like, it was less yeah. than ideal. But no, we'll brush <laughs> the over that part. Aspect, yeah, <laughs> the, the Tom <laughs> Allen aspect, uh, Kalen DeBoer was there. Michael Penix was there. Like that was a, a fun team to cover for those few months that I did. Um, but Tom was always like incredibly kind. Right. And and I, I always remember that. And it was it was funny being in that press conference. today is like a flashback. Like Greg Kincaid, the uh, who works in Penn State Stratcom, the SID was also at Indiana when Tom was there. So like being in the, you know what I mean? Being in this press conference. Pick with, up the same room, put it in Beaver Stadium. Yeah, and, like yeah. being at being at that, at that press conference with Tom there, like it was a little bit of a flashback. Yeah, I, my impression of him today was the positivity. Um, you know, I know he always kind of gets compared to, and we talked about this with Andy last week, the uh, Ted Lasso kind of positive vibes, good vibes, like, there's a chance, and again, I will see what happens on the field. We've got a ways to go till we get to that point. <laughs> I'm just a little worried that, like, the next time we're in the Lash building, every single wall is going to be covered with a slogan. Yeah. Like, it just seems like, I mean, what, the thing today was it's Tom saying is Elio. Me uh, and. Oh, uh, well, so, so Tom does they, Elio, not I which is, is, is love each other. Oh, that, that was this whole thing in Indiana, oh. uh, but no, I, the the we. So are yeah, they no. are they going to be getting Leo like wristbands, t shirts? Like, what's the extent of this? No idea. <laughs> I have no idea if he's going to be nice. bringing the uh, the catchphrases with him from Bloomington. But uh, I, I do think like it's a really good hire, though. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the energy, like he's replacing some of the energy lost from Manny Diaz, even if it kind of manis- manifests itself in different ways. Uh, I wrote about that. You can read it. Center Daily. That's a good com. point. I like that. Yeah, I like. That. Uh, but like it's the same, it's it is the same level of energy, right? It just looks different. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I, I think schematically, though, this was something that uh, I, I think they crushed it, right? Like 
James disagreed with me clearly and said that they wanted uh, four down linemen. They wanted a forefront as Pat Kraft told us today when he spoke uh, that that was one of the things that they were looking for. And then Pat said uh, that this was uh, probably, he was probably giving away too much information uh, when he said that. Uh, but I do think that, you know, I mentioned earlier, they run a four, two, five. They have a Husky as the the fifth defensive back. That's a, usually a bigger defensive back, um, but it's not playing the actual that. dog to be clear. Yes, which you would hate because you hate all dogs. And you are wrong about not. this. I do not. It's it's your worst take. Um, it's just incorrect. I think that's the biggest problem with it. But uh, <laughs> he he runs that same type of scheme. It's just, I don't want to get too into the X's and O's here. I don't want to bore people. I know some people might not be interested in that. If you are interested in that, mm -hmm. let us know. We can spend, like, we'll, I don't know about you, We've Audrey. Got all record, season. Like, yeah, we'll spend some time like breaking down some stuff because I'll be watching the all 22 of, mm -hmm. of Tom again, which fortunately is less extensive because I've seen it before a lot. Uh, but he is he's he uses more disguises in the back end. Right. Like there's there's more ambiguity as to what they're doing pre snap. Like it's confusing that word again. That word again. Yes, uh, it's a good word. What do you want? Uh, but they, there's there's more disguise to what they're doing. Uh, I You know, you you saw that. Kyle McCord, specifically in the Ohio State game, was able to – Kyle McCord, specifically as a quarterback, mm -hmm. is someone that pre-snap, if he sees what he needs to see, he knows where to go, right? But if things change post-snap, then it gets a little bit messier, right? Like it, things get, get a little more difficult for him. Tom Allen is going to present disguises, and he's going to present quarterbacks' challenges that they have to solve post-snap. And that is much more taxing on a quarterback in the college level than it is the NFL level. Uh, coverage disguises are still very much a thing in the NFL. Vic Fangio, Dolphins mm -hmm. defensive coordinator, is like legendary for the fact that everything is disguised constantly. Um, but I think it, it, it's, it's even more valuable in college as long as your guys understand it, right? As long as they know where they're going, where they need to be, and they can recover where they need to recover to and what have you. Uh, but I do think this is – this is the kind of hire that you make when you want to make the playoff, right? Like they, they have a guy who was a head coach for seven years. I saw people saying stuff about him not being a defensive coordinator. I really like James's answer to that question today about, are you uh, just saying that? Cause it was your question. Is that what this is, John? I said, I like the the answer, not the question, the question, whatever I I'm doing what I can as the only one who's doing asking, what I can <laughs> as the only one asking the Tom Allen question out there. I'm trying to get what I can, but uh, the setup is not ideal. No, um, it wasn't. No, I, I, the thing that while you're we're talking about kind of catchphrases and his defense pop quiz, John, you've seen it before. I don't know if you've heard this one before. What's the DNA to a Tom Allen defense? Uh, you failed the turnovers. Quiz. No takeaways, tackling and energy, right? Effort. Close. Takeaways, effort. tackling. Close. Effort. I, knew e. I knew it was an E. T Same idea. T T E. Is there, is there anything to that? Is that going to get slapped on a t-shirt or a wristband? No, that's it's, He'll say stuff like that, but it's the 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 only catchphrase really is the LEO thing, the love each other, which was a, a big a big deal in their 2020 season, which was a great season, which he, he oh, doubled boy. down and listen, <laughs> I don't wanna go. I don't wanna make people mad, but so, that was a that was a good two point conversion. Michael Penix did get in the end zone. <laughs> I so I was there covering that game, and that of course, you know, I'm sure Penn State fans you remember it vividly, but it was the first game of the, the 2020 delayed season. Um very surreal even when you think about it now. I mean, I was sitting in the press box. Literally, my seat was surrounded by plexiglass. Um, I drove out to Bloomington. It was like one of the only times I could actually stay, you know, in Bloomington. Got Mother's Bear, Mother Bear's pizza delivered to my room or take out to my room. I um, love Mother Bear's. It is fantastic of, it is, pizza. I th like I think it's my favorite pizza place in the world. Mm, I, I love it. There's I, listen, a place I in Atlanta. We'll find out this this coming week. Antico's, but I, really yeah. Good. I think uh, those ten months I ate mother's mother bears like forty five times. It was something absurd. Like I was constantly was getting. So and when I go like, back, I go to mother bears. I, you know what? Yeah, I. That's the. Um, I didn't. I didn't go last year to the the Bloomington game, and that was like my one big regret. It wasn't not covering the game. It was I couldn't get mother bears. Um, but yeah, kind of peak peak COVID season, eating pizza and drinking whiskey in my hotel room alone in nice. Bloomington. That was a that was a highlight. Uh, but going to the game and then, you know, you watch the play. I'm with you. I, I thought it was a successful conversion. I look at it now. I still can see it that way. Tom Allen when... said he still sees it that way, but did acknowledge it depends yes. kind of which lens you're looking at, which sideline you were on. Um, he did say he had a big photo 
of the two point conversion that he used to have in his office. Unclear if that photo is making the trip, but I think it's safe to say that will not be in his office in Penn State. I want to know whose photo it is, though, right? Because our uh, yeah. wonderful photographer, Abby Dry of the Center Daily mm-hmm. Times, took the, the like shot. a great photo and won like uh, awards for that photo of like, yeah. it looks like, you know, I have it pulled up here. It, you can't really tell. It's just a great photo. I mm-hmm. think he's in from it. That's the photo that a lot of people cite, though, when they say yes. that he's not in. Um, but it's a great photo regardless. Tremendous uh, photo. But I, w- I wonder, wh- like, you know what I mean? Like, which one he has uh, of that of that play. Maybe we'll find um, out. Maybe we'll, one day yeah, we'll... something something worth worth asking about um but i do think from a, a schematic standpoint that he's he's going to put them in a position to succeed and the downside that i think people usually see in head coaches is or a head coach becoming a coordinator is like they're biding time until they get the next job listen i don't want to read too much into an introductory press conference but man it did not it sound, sound, he did like, not sound it, yeah. like a guy who wants to be a head coach again he sounded like a guy who was <laughs> sick of it, <laughs> like wants to just talk ball all the time. Yes, I very much got, again, first impression. So I, who knows? But I very much came away with the impression of like, I'm happy to be here. I'm really elated to be the linebackers coach at Linebacker U. Um, happy to have all the head coaching stuff off of my plate and just to be a position coach and a coordinator again. He like, said it several times. Yeah. And that was, he said, James Franklin, you know, throughout the interview process, both sides were really upfront with what they were looking for. And they wanted to make sure that, you know, Tom Allen was kind of on board with, Hey, what are your non-negotiables in terms of what are the tenets of your defense and how do you need to, you know, to make that work just to make sure everybody's on the same page, uh, which again is, is the right thing to do. And so I'm with you. Like he, he said, like, he's not here to like, he's not focused on, you know, parlaying this into springboarding this into a head coaching job again we'll see you know things change goals change ambitions change i get that um but yeah he didn't kind of come in where manny diaz i think it was it was more yeah, up it was front with it off the bat. um but he did uh tom allen almost did it almost called him the wrong name i almost called him tim uh, tom allen did say that he met with <laughs> <laughs> he met with abdul carter uh briefly on wednesday that abdul was in the weight room so, you know, he had a chance to talk with him and said, like, basically something along the lines of, yes, I remember you gave us a lot of trouble before. Like, I can't wait to coach you type of thing. So, you know, Tom Allen's going to be at obviously at the bowl site watching practices. He said he wants to observe not only how the players practice, but how they communicate and how they are in the meeting rooms, how they interact with the other assistant coaches. Right. Which I think sets up a bit of an interesting dynamic for this week in Atlanta. <laughs> because it certainly feels like everything's under the microscope. And yeah. I want to ask, you know, the players when we're there about that, because, you know, we always hear the bowl game is obviously it's a big game. It's an important game, especially when it's a new year's six game, but it's supposed to be, you know, you're there for about a week. It's a celebration of the season. There's all these quirky activities, usually all that stuff, but it sure seems like to me, just because of the the current setup that everything and everyone's being evaluated um, and it's kind of maybe hard to enjoy yourself in that setting. Although, what do they say? Pressure makes pipes or diamonds or some burst pipes <laughs> make diamonds. There's, have you ever heard that? <laughs> Pressure <laughs> bursts thing. pipes and makes diamonds. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's I don't a, know what the hell that was, but I, I did enjoy it. You didn't know uh, that? I'm, I'm no, gonna I get do that. know that's it. I just don't know what slogan. you were trying I'm going to get that to. printed on a t-shirt. If we're going to go all, what was the, love each other if, if we're going to go all yeah, that, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm going to get a diamond on a t-shirt or something. I don't know. Um, well, I, I do think though, like, uh, and this was with Kota Wineke especially, mm-hmm. who's really good at disconnecting, like that they'll probably be able to like not care about that stuff when they're not, you know what I mean? In, in practice, in meetings yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Like, I no, think, they'll I, be fine I think it's regard. coming from a, I think it's coming from a good place. I just, I think for yeah. the players, it's kind of like you're, you're, everybody's trying to get to, not everybody, but a yeah. lot of people are trying to get to it know each a, other. It can be awkward, I think, for sure. Um, but I do think the and we heard Tom emphasize this today. Like he he said that like he emphasizes relationships, right? And he really cares about relationships. Yeah. And again, I covered him before. I, I know a bunch of people that covered him. I have a lot of friends that cover Indiana and everything. That is without a doubt true, right? Like he really cares about the humanity aspect of coaching. About the we heard about Andy Kotonek, he talked about the teaching aspect and the mm-hmm. humanity aspect. Tom Allen also very much cares about the the humanity and the teaching. He was a high school coach and high school teacher for a long time in Florida, in Indiana, right? Like he was, 
he was a head coach at Indianapolis Ben Davis, which is a, a big school out in Indianapolis. Uh, like before he he moved up into the college ranks and everything. And in fact, I I, I don't know if a lot of people know this. You know, he's only been a Division One coordinator for two years, right? Like he was a D one coordinator at okay. South Florida for a year and at Indiana for a year, and that's it. And then he got the Indiana job and has was... been doing that ever since. Uh, so that's a, one of the reasons I asked James about that track record thing today too, because it's not just that it's seven years ago it's that mm-hmm. it's smaller than you would think now he was good as an Ole Miss linebackers coach like right. and he's had success he put up a, a pretty a, a decent season at South Florida and they had a phenomenal season at Indiana I think they were 20th if I remember correctly in SB plus on defense and his one year's defensive coordinator and Franklin pointed to the the most improved right yes. that was kind of the the point and and the other thing is I've seen a lot of consternation over the fact that they maybe haven't been good defensively over the last seven years I can't stress enough how difficult it is to be the head coach and to be the defensive coordinator in college specifically. Mm -hmm. It is impossible. Coaches that like, there are coaches that can call an offense, but even I think you will find that their staffs are filled with guys that are really throughout the week running the offense, right? And then they're calling the plays, right? Uh, So I think there is, uh, there's reason to, to give uh, him some slack essentially for how Indiana's defense played over the years. He's had some really good defensive coordinators. Kane Womack stands out uh, who's at South Alabama now as the head coach and has had success there. Um, some guys who haven't worked out, but like, I do think that he is going to be a positive impact, even if there isn't the same level of defense being played next year, because they're going to lose talent. Like we know that right, uh, right. his job is to maximize what's there. But I also don't think this has to be – I don't know whether they're at an SB plus right now. I know they're top 10. But I don't think it has to be as high as it is now for him to be a, deemed a success in year one. I think we will figure out how successful he can be at Penn State based on what they do on the field. And it's going to be tough to judge it based off the year-to-year numbers just because, as James Franklin said, and as you asked Tom about today, like they're the number one defense in total defense, which is not a metric that I use a ton. Mm-hmm. But like they're the number one defense in total defense. You literally can't improve off of that particular stat. Yeah. And I think to me, it's like you look at like, I think it's a good point. And I know you and I have talked about it on here before, too. Right. Like, how do you maximize and uplift this defense when Chop Robinson, we know for sure, isn't going to be here? Um, There's other decisions that haven't been made public yet, but we talked about the cornerback room, right? The changes there, like you still have the bones and the structure in place to have a very, very good defense but it's going to look a little bit different and there's going to be some growing pains. And I, I think the point Terry Smith made today about the corners was a really good one is because you look at it and you're like, yeah, I mean, you're right. Like people have been spoiled by the play of the, the corners. And I know some people want to nitpick and Joey Porter and, Oh, he was, he was too hands on and those types of things, right? Like people are always going to have their, their nits to pick and those types of things. Um, I won't but, do it even though I want to hold back, John, hold back. The, The thing that you and I can pick apart here that I, again, I think just is is a very good reminder of like the differences in professions of the people that we cover, right? And kind of the the interesting part of this, Tom Allen's buyout at Indiana, right? $15.5 million. Well, and it was... He didn't need to coach college football. He didn't need to do anything. It was also negotiated down, by right. the way. Like it was 20, 20 yeah, 20 or 20.8, something like that. He negotiated down on one of the stipulations that there's no offsets in the contract. So essentially any money he makes at Penn State is new money and is not just taken away from the Indiana money, um, which is different than how Manny Diaz's contract was when he uh, was at Penn State. Uh, and I reported on Tuesday. I don't know what day of the week yeah, it Tuesday. is. Tuesday's ones, yeah. yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, uh, Tuesday that the uh, – he will be making 1.5 million in the first year of his contract, 1.6 and then 1.7, which is 0.1 million less than Andy Kotelnicki will be making in all three of those years. It kind of makes sense. Um, and Andy's is a four-year deal, right? Might, yes, yeah, and in year deal. four for Andy, he'll make two million, uh, as you and I both reported. Um, Penn State, for what it's worth, does not release those contract numbers. Uh, we reached out to them because they there's been stuff in the legislature, whatever, I won't bore everyone with the details. Essentially, the Penn State as a university is going to have to release more financial data. Evidently, this still does not fall under the purview. So uh, we had to do the work to find it out and, and get that information and report it uh, to the to the listeners and our readers. Uh, but we that information is out there now. Uh, and, you know, the Allen salary being a little bit less than Kodonicki makes sense given that they were not competing with anyone 
for him, right? Like mm-hmm. Kotelniki, Kansas was trying to keep Kotelniki. They were making he him had a great good situation. Offer. Yeah. Yes, he's yes, in a good yes. situation. They're making him great offers to stay, uh, and Penn State is trying to pry him away. Whereas with Tom Allen, he's available. He's not working anywhere, as he said. James Franklin reached out to him first, and like, you know, he's uh, he said how grateful he is for the opportunity today, like and that he's excited for this, and you can tell he's excited for this. Um, but like, this is uh, you know, this was a timeline that didn't have to be as rushed because, as as James put it there was nobody on the other end trying to keep Tom away from him. Right. With Andy, Kansas is trying to keep you. So you have to like try and expedite it. Uh, and so I assume this negotiation process was smoother. That being said, you don't want to underpay him because you, you want like, he needs to make right. around what Kodo Nicky does because otherwise it's just a bad look, right? Like it's like a, it's a respect thing, I think. And I, so that For makes sure. sense. Why they're For not John, paying him nothing. If you had the opportunity to make fifteen point five million dollars to not work, what would you do? I think you're gonna say I'm insane for this. I would probably keep writing. I would find something to cover. I don't know if it would. I mean, honestly, my no, but for real. <laughs> I listen. I like. I love what I do. And See, I, don't, I was not gonna say I like what I do, but I, I genuinely love what I do. And I've said this to a lot of people. I'll be doing this till I die. Uh, I accept that. <laughs> Preferably like not is, the Nitty Dispatch podcast. We have to wheel them out of here one day. Yeah, but uh, this is this job's a lot of fun. This podcast is a lot of fun. I really appreciate everyone who who listens and watches. And that, well, now I, you're going to make me is, sound like an asshole. Well, no, I was going to say I think I can speak for you too in saying that like we both do appreciate all that. But no, I like yeah. I got into journalism. We're at minute fifty five. If you're still here, thank you. <laughs> I deeply appreciate that. Absolutely. But if this is about to go further off the rails, I'm sorry. Uh, but you know, I got into journalism because it's fun, right? Like, because I love sports and, you know, those things. So like, I honestly, and, and that's why when he made that decision to get back into coaching, despite being paid 15 and a half million dollars, like, I mean, on a very different scale, I get it. Right? Like, <laughs> it gets, we, I, we I remember relate. when I was, yeah, like when I was looking for a job, I was just like bored. Uh, right. Like I like the uh, work. Listen, we work a lot. We look, mm-hmm. work very long hours but I also wouldn't trade it for anything. Like I enjoyed a lot. So this is, uh, the, despite if someone offered me 15 and a half million dollars to leave this job, I would probably just find a similar one and keep making the 15 and a half million dollars. Your own job. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you could find me on a beach drinking, having a good time, <laughs> but don't worry, John, not- I would still come on to talk Penn state football for with that's you right. and for all of our, our good friends here at the Nitty dispatch. Um, no, I mean, I think to me, that's again, like he's, and, and the way he kind of said it, it was kind of like, this was a no brainer. Like, Oh yeah, I'm a football coach. This. this is what I do. Yes. Um, you know, obviously that's so much of his identity as, as a person, as a, you know, more than an occupation. Cause obviously there, we can complain about our hours, uh, their hours. Well, I are think nuts. Too, their, the, the identity aspect, it's not just as a coach though. And these guys view themselves this way. And I think correctly for the most part, uh, specifically with, with Kodoniki and, and Alan, like they view themselves as teachers, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and as someone who helps people grow. And like, I think that is a large part of the joy. You could tell with Kodoniki, that was like a major thing with him that he really enjoys teaching. Uh, and I think that is, it's not just like their identity isn't just coaching. It's like helping people develop. <laughs> you keep making me sound worse and worse, John, because I do teach. That is my other job. And I would walk away from that too. <laughs> so I, I am nothing like the people I cover. Apparently. Um, Listen, eventually, eventually <laughs> me having a master's degree. Like me. No. Event, yeah. Well, eventually me having a master's degree will lead me to teaching and then I'll want to not do that anymore. So no, it, no, but I, I, I get the, in all seriousness, like teaching is a lot of fun. Um, and you learn what people know and what they don't know. And, and I was a and double major in journalism and secondary ed. And you kind of, there's, there's value, there's benefit, there's enjoyment in that. Um, there are also other days where you're like, man, this is, this can be a lot of yeah, great papers. Job. Uh, but right now it's great because, uh, Penn state already had their, their finals week last week. So I was able to kind of breeze through our jam packed signing day, um, because of that. And then we got the bowl trip coming up, John. Yep. Big old Five bowl trip. Away. We got Christmas in between. Um, like I said, I am hoping to unplug, disconnect, hang out. Hopefully there's no news. We'll see. Um, there is a, uh, unfortunately oh no. for me, a Penn State oh. men's basketball game Thursday night, which I will be covering. Uh, so not Thursday quite. Night, and, though, that's... 
Yeah, but there's a lot of pre-writing that I want to do because I, right. and again, we're, we're just off the rails of this. We're, so yeah, this uh, yeah. But like when we get down to these bull trips, I like to just enjoy myself, right? Like I want, we have our What does that look like, John? Morning. You know what it looks like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that. Uh, but the, uh, you know, we have these availabilities usually earlier in the day and like mm-hmm. I want to get through those and I want to write off of those and I want to have all my other stuff kind of taken care of, right? And so I want to be able to enjoy wherever we're at. We're in, last yeah. year was Los Angeles. This year, you know, being Atlanta, or just enjoy like the fact that we're all there, like we're all in the same place where we. I think the bowl trips a are lot fun. Of, yes. Yeah. Yep. The pretty much the entire beat goes, and all of us get along. We all hang out with each other. You and I doing this podcast is not like the only friendship on the beat. Like everyone gets along with each other. Uh, we shout out a lot of people, a lot of time on here for. for you know, a reason like we think highly of them. This is a good yeah. chance to go down and hang out with them and everything too. So I'll be writing regrettably on Friday <laughs> and probably uh, I'll do some early Christmas with, with, with my family on Saturday. Uh, and then uh, the Christmas Eve, I'll probably be writing a little more and hopefully I'll have it done so I can enjoy the uh, Christmas day and enjoy the Eagles trying Eagles, to break my yeah. spirit. Yeah, yeah, that's the the, the old uh, NFL Sunday Christmas Eve is interesting. Christmas Day games. We got the yep. Saturday games now again as of last week, so it's all spread out. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun trip. Uh, we will definitely we'll have a podcast at some point before the game from down there. Yes. Um, if other I, stuff happens, we will podcast then too. As we just not on through. Christmas. That's my that's my only yes. stipulation, John. But for fifteen and a half million dollars, I would podcast on Christmas. No, Listen, I I'll probably wouldn't. I would probably podcast on Christmas anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever, whatever, I'm not doing much. Uh, yeah, I think that the uh, beauty of leaving the day after Christmas is that I am like, and I appreciate my family ac- acquiescing to me. Like, <laughs> I don't want to do anything on Christmas Day because it's like I'm, I'm we're gonna leave yeah. the next day. It's gonna be a long week, uh, so I just want to relax and you know get the Christmas stuff out of the way early. Wow, that's your that's your your holiday spirit, John. The, just get it out of the way early. No, um, let's not get it out of the way early. It's enjoy it early. There you go. No, it'll be nice. Makes I'll, you look bad I'll, one last uh, time. Yeah, that's you know just back over me with the bus today, John. Happy holidays. Uh, no, it'll it'll be it'll be fun. I'll go home, see my parents, uh, see my niece and nephew, uh, who I'm sure will be will be very energetic. They're little, so that'll be fun. Um, but yeah, I will head down Tuesday. James Franklin has a Zoom on Tuesday, and when then I'm we're in the air. same. We're getting coordinators. Wednesday, Thursday, which I guess will be the co it's, it's going to be the co coordinate, the co interim coordinators uh, yes. and some players. So we will have plenty of stuff to be churning out uh, at our respective websites. Again, if there are opt outs or if there are any more draft decisions, we will, we will get those to you as quickly as humanly possible. Um, but if you are listening to this, maybe you are traveling for the holidays or maybe you are, putting the end to your work week as well. Like I am, I think, um, hope you you have a wonderful holiday season. Um, we appreciate you guys listening and being here. Um, this is, you know, been a a fun project this year. We've kind of just launched, launched this thing and just we're winging it as we go. Uh, so it's been really nice to to hear from a lot of you and a lot of you have asked us, you know, when are you going to record or we enjoy the show? So it really, really means a lot. Um, Because, again, we are here to bring you closer to the team and the program that you care about. Like, that's our goal. Um, We'll be continuing to do that all bowl week, all offseason as well. John, anything? I get No, we didn't even talk about, gosh, well, we can briefly talk about Pat Kraft, the athletic director, talked today. Beaver Stadium, they're 30% 30 of the way through the design. It's going to be a while. It's going to be a while, yeah. Yeah, Um, there's not a ton to say there. Uh, Pat, like you said, spoke today. There was... You know, there was discussions about like some of the construction mm-hmm. stuff. The second floor of the Lash building is currently under construction or about to go under dis- construction. I think it was how he phrased yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, he mentioned a really interesting uh, tampering story where they were on their way to, uh, or they might have been in Vegas already for oh, Olu Fashionu's yeah. Campbell Trophy, mm-hmm. uh, you know, nomination stuff. And an agent reached out to them with a list of like eight players that asking if they were interested in them. And one of them was a Penn state player, <laughs> uh, which is fire Unnamed that named Penn state player. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever that player no is, I needs to fire that agent. <laughs> like that is, that is not good. Um, but no, I, I think, you know, 
Pat spoke for a while today, but there's sometimes, you know, with the athletic director, there's just not like a ton to touch on when, when there's not a ton of it's stuff almost going like on. almost like a, like a bill becoming a law, right? Where there's all these incremental things yes. that happen. Yep. Um, Some and status Beaver stadiums. Yeah. Always, always the big one. But yeah, that tampering story was really interesting. Uh, that's something that James Franklin spoke about last week as well. Tampering in the portal is out there. It's rampant, but how do you fix it? Right. And that's kind of the, the thing that everyone has to, has to figure out here. Um, and that I can certainly say, John, figuring out and fixing portal tampering, that's above our pay grade. That's actually, not my job. Know. Yeah. I mean, it's, we'll have to write about it and th- think about it, but that is actually fixing it is not us. Yes, it is not my problem, and I do not plan to make it my problem. Uh, but no, I think that's really the, the gist of it from from Kraft today. There, was, there wasn't there was a ton. Uh, but as you said, you know, wish everyone listening, watching, happy holidays, whatever you celebrate, enjoy yourself, enjoy your time with your family. Um, you know, this is, uh, it's a, it's a weird time of the year because like the season's ending, but it's also like our busiest time. So like you said, we will have stuff on our respective websites, you over at the athletic.com, uh, me at sendaily.com. Uh, Audrey will be tweeting her stuff at odd Snyder four. And I will do the same at John Sauber again, no H and John, there's never been an H in John, despite some people sure. replying to me in emails and throwing it in there to, and my signature, not having one, uh, oh, so you got I my email. the original email out. Yeah, I do, Audrey, all the time. Uh, but no, I, I you know, I, like you said, appreciate everyone. Uh, you know, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Those five star reviews really help. The thumbs up down below on YouTube and the subscribe button really help us there. Uh, but I think that is a, a good place to end it. And like Audrey said, we will be back when stuff happens. We will be back during the week and, you know, for the foreseeable future. So thank you for tuning in. Have a great day.